Uh, I want to start off by just asking what the kernel of the idea that kind of inspired this project in the first place was. Uh, I mean, the the original idea, it's not really an idea because so much of it is is based on my own life experiences. Um, the, the way I try to describe it is to say it's, um, you know, a condensed version of a lot of things that happened to me, with the exception of the comedy. I never did do stand-up. <laughs> oh, so the only good part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, although, you know, I don't know, it's also terrifying. I mean, I, 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 I've always been a lover of stand-up. I, um, I was, you know, sort of dating a comedian many, many years ago when I first moved to New York, and through him I got to know that world really well. And uh, almost immediately, I was already writing, so I thought... I, because I kept going every night to see it, I started realizing how much they change the jokes and the writing and the delivery. It's sort of this amalgamation of everything that I love. It's like writing, delivery, acting, some sort of self-directing. So it was just something that I immediately um, gravitated towards. And then, obviously, I mean, I'm not the first one to say it, that you can get away with so much if you're making somebody laugh. And uh, people like, say, Richard Pryor, for example, who was really a pioneer of also talking about his own abuse and so many of the really dark things that he went through um, on stage. It's just something that, you know, I was going through a lot of that stuff and trying to process it and sometimes I just needed to laugh. So it really um, helped me get through a lot of the stuff. So when I wanted to write it, I at some point thought about it. I was like, oh, she should be a comedian. It makes total sense. Uh, and then I thought it was a great way of being able to show how she presents herself on stage and how she wants people to see her initially versus what's going on in her own life. Right. And yeah, the the comedy world is kind of the perfect outlet for exploring <laughs> some of those, you know, your personal history. So what what was it like researching the comedy world? Because I know it can be very insular and uh, culty. Yeah, I didn't do a ton of research because I felt that I pulled a lot from my time there, um, th which was mostly the New York Comedy Club. I don't know the... I mean, now I, I know a lot of comedians, but um, I don't spend as much time in comedy clubs as I did at that time, you know? It's like 20 years old, and you could still smoke in New York and get watered down free drinks, and I spent a lot of time there, and it was very inspiring. So I think a lot of it was just my own experiences that I had had there, and certainly in terms of, especially then, it was almost all guys, and it, it, it also felt very, um, yeah, just outright sexist and at, at the time in a way that, even though we know it still is, it's not, um, it's not as much anymore, and there's so many female comedians now. So that was pretty accessible to me in terms of, say, how, like, Mike and her talk to, you know, the Jay Moore character talk to each other or whatever. It's also something that weirdly I'm very comfortable with. I think a lot of writers are big shit talkers. I am. It's something that, you know, I, I just, I'm very comfortable in that world. <laughs> yeah. So what about for Mary Elizabeth Winstead was, uh, you obviously had to train her to act like a real comedian. So what did you do in terms of your direction? Yeah, I mean, she's pretty spectacular on her own. I really didn't do that much. She, I mean, and she said this herself, that was the part that really worried her and scared her. Um, she's obviously such an accomplished, dramatic actor. I think she, you know, I mean, I knew, she, I never had, any, I'd never worried about her not being able to hit any of those notes, but we did rehearse the stand-up quite a lot, just so that um, she could get the rhythm of it, the physicality, and also just, find her own way of saying it in kind of similar way to what I was saying when I first started watching stand-up that, you know, you, you just have to feel it on your own. So we did a lot of that and then, you know, we both, I mean, I had always had it anyway, but I had her listen to things a lot, so like albums, so that again, you know, best comedians always make things sound like they just came up with it, but they didn't. So it's, you know, it's great storytelling. And then once that was sort of down, we also worked with a comedian named Jamie Luftus, who's our comedy consultant on the film. He's a very young and smart and hilarious and dirty comedian who I think we just, you know, happen to um, see things very similarly and have a very similar sense of humor. And she was great and instrumental in terms of also taking us like that last step that I probably couldn't have done on my own. And uh, 
And uh, yeah, we were also when we shot it, both Jamie and I would throw a lot of jokes at Mary and she kind of started improv in the way, the way that sometimes comedians do. So I sort of feel like by the time we shot it, she was fully in the zone of, you know, what that means. And I think she really enjoyed doing it. It was a pleasure for me to watch her do it. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I feel like comedians are so often stereotyped as tortured individuals who are using comedy as an outlet, mm -hmm. as their only outlet for self-expression. So what was it like crafting this story of, uh, you know, this character with a lot of suppressed emotions and kind of channeling that through humor, which is, you know, for a lot of people, it's kind of a release, but for her, it feels like she's kind of just spitting out dark energy. Huh, that's interesting, yeah. You know, I, I sort of feel like in my mind, she, you know, she is aware of what it is that's bothering her. She just hasn't bridged the gap of allowing herself to be in a relationship and live with that. It, it of course, comes out in the worst possible way and is directly, you know, related to her relationship. But, um, I don't know. I guess it felt familiar to me. I, I mean, I... I often process things that way as well, you know, like I'll think like, what's the worst possible scenario? And then I, I go as dark as I can and then it makes me feel better because I already know what it is. It is a very comedic thing well, to assault. do. In uh, sexual assault, sorry. the I know the term victim is kind of avoided. Yeah. Um, so in what ways uh, did you want um, this story to empower um, Nina? and potentially, you know, survivors who are watching the movie. Yeah, it's funny that I, uh, you know, I've been, I've obviously, like I said, kicking this around for a long time, and I think I started writing it, I guess, three years ago now, you know, before a lot of the, uh, all of the Me Too stuff happened. It's such a different world now in the last six months, so I feel like already there's so much more awareness, like even in what you just said, that I'm not calling somebody a victim and calling them a survivor, which I also, she actually used to have her little routine about you know how it's great that we all call ourselves survivors but a lot of us actually don't survive you know um it was funnier than what i just said but uh there is something to that as well it's like plenty of people don't make it through so i don't in any way try to minimize it but yeah for me the thing that i really wanted to do at the time was um sort of bring an awareness to the fact that this is everywhere and that sometimes when you're going about your life and say you know the woman who at the cash register or your doctor or anything like that that they might have gone through an experience like this the night before you know so you see Nina doing her job and doing it well she's like gives a great performance one night and then she gets home and she gets hit by her boyfriend or whatever he is so but this is a constant push and pull in a lot of people's lives and I'm very aware of that because I've you know been in those circles and talked about it and know a lot of women who are open to it and men and all of that but I, I, I think it's an important awareness for all of us to have that there's sometimes an idea by the way perpetrated often by films and TV that you know if somebody has been hit that you can tell or that they are going to be sad about and of course they are inside but people also just have to go on with their lives as she does so that was one thing and then, yeah, I mean, in terms of survivors, I also, it was important to me to have a realistic and at least hopeful representation of somebody who also, whose life is also not destroyed by this, um, and without minimizing the impact of it. Obviously, she has issues, but she also does what she loves and does it well. And my idea is that at least, even if Rafe is in, isn't and doesn't end up being the guy that she's with forever and ever that she's capable of having a relationship and that um there's hope for her as there is for almost everybody so i i hope survivors and other people are taking that you know away from it i don't know yeah definitely yeah um so rafe common was great um yeah. so great uh what uh is he kind of um a, a female fantasy or more <laughs> of a, a realistic good guy that you're using as a call to action for male viewers to be more supportive or thoughtful well what did you think how did you see him i i saw him as a, a hopeful you know a signifier of hope that yeah. you know as for every bad guy in the scenario there's a really good guy who's not going to be judgmental who's going to be patient with her and help her through it yeah but 
you know, he's he's such a such a kind of an angel to her. I'm I'm wondering, you know, what yeah. the inspiration for the character was. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. He's, you know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different men that I've known in my life in him. There's also a lot of me in him, actually, as most writers. You know, it's like, it's easy to say, oh, I'm Nina, but I'm also Lake, and I'm also Rafe, and um, perhaps maybe not Joe. Um, but uh, it's funny because I initially did start writing him as more of a fantasy because so much of this film I've tried to sort of turn stereotypes over on their heads. So, like, in theory, he would be the girl character, right, in a, in a movie here that, like, he's always there supporting her and, you know, never fault, faltering and that kind of thing. But then as I started writing Rafe, I really was like, that's not being fair to him or to any character. Because, you know, I get mad when I watch those movies and girls are just there, you know, as a, what's the word? Um, Arm candy or trophy? Yeah, or just as a device for whatever it is that the main character is going, you know, usually the guy is going through. So, of course, he developed and then, I, I don't know, I took a lot from, I know a couple of guys in California who, I like a lot of um, subgroups as well. So, like, I when I moved to L.A., I realized there's also, like, you know, a bunch of California Latin men who love punk or, you know, or like uh, black men who love like um, surf. Indie rock. Yeah, like this stuff. And you never really see that stuff on on TV either, you know, uh, on, on, on movies, on the screen. So I really liked that. And I was kind of getting into California and seeing what that was like, you know, like, I don't know if you know that band, The Growlers, which we play. And anyway, it's sort of, you know, not the way you usually see California. So I kind of started from there and then thought, um, you know, he should also be flawed. And honestly, I wish I could have spent more time with the two of them, but obviously it was her story. And then I think once Rashid came, uh, Common came in, he also really identified with him. And, uh, you know, so much of casting and work when you're a director and an actor is just like, do you see the part, uh, uh, you know, in the same way? And I think we both really understood him the same way. I also think because Common is such an empathetic, and I think he allows himself to be so vulnerable and sort of goofy in the, in the best kind of way, mm -hmm. which is unusual for a leading man who's also as handsome as Common is to play it that way, which I love about the performance. That like, you know, he's not apologetic about his looks or his sort of hunkiness, but he also, it's not that he seems insecure, but he he's almost like... He lets himself be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and we talked a lot about that and also the role of men in any of... I mean, not just in the life of somebody who's a survivor, but just in general, which obviously is something that, is all, that Nina is also preoccupied with. Like, you know, we want our men to be sensitive, but we also want them to, you know, beat the crap out of somebody. If we need them to. Like, I think it's those questions are all things that... Um, inside of feminism need to be answered and looked at by men as well as by women, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're kind of two sides of a coin yeah. and the like, expectations men... go both ways. Yeah, I always have... A, I actually kind of want to write an... It's not a sequel in that way, but I want to explore that aspect of it because I think it's really important and I know a lot of my male friends. Um, where are men now in in this conversation? You know, I, I find them to be really... Um, not present and I'm, I don't blame it on them I'm just saying like it's always seen as a women's issue when actually it's a human issue you know right well that that's one of the things I feel like your movie achieved with the commons character yeah. um just because I, f I feel like a, a lot of movies that have a feminist agenda will get so focused you know they won't show how femininity and masculinity kind of go hand in hand and he's I think a great example of um I guess the way men should be acting and thinking. Yeah, and he also gets mad at her and at himself for punching the guy out, even though he does it, right? Yeah, sure. I also try to do that with um, Jordan's character, Dustin, the guy that she makes out with in the closet, which is, you know, it happens so fast, but I remember a lot of women watching it and thinking, oh no, is she going to get raped when she goes in there? And it was important to me to have not just Common's character, but... Uh, somebody else who my joke was always that like he is the perfect man and she happens to finally meet him when she's already in love with somebody else because he's like I'm sensitive and, I, and I'm strong <laughs> right you know? no yeah there there are a lot of scenes like that the film is kind of like a slow motion train wreck at times <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of scenes where you move right up to the edge of you know something terrible potentially happening right. and then kind of dodged away from it and it was almost more effective to do that just because you know, you get the audience to expect the worst, and then when it doesn't happen, 
it makes them reflect more like, oh, why, why did I think that was going to happen? Like, right. Is that because that is so, you know, normal? or Yeah. Um, Slow motion train wreck. I might have to steal that one. Yeah, I I'll like it. Put it on the poster. <laughs> uh, remind me the name of the character that um, Nina st- stays with. Who Joe. Joe, yeah. yeah. Um, so what was your inspiration for including that character and kind of lightly satirizing all of the spirituality and, you know, the Reiki and the cat right. therapy session? Oh, so Joe and Lake, the two of them, or...? Uh, yeah, 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 both of them. I mean, Joe, um, the character is very much based on... It, basically, the story that Nina tells in that monologue in her apartment the morning after is very much the way I met Joe. I didn't have the relationship with him that that she has in the movie, but it wasn't hard for me to sort of put that together. That so the story, you know, that I, I have a friend of mine who was raped. I took her to the police station, and all that story that she tells about we were there for three hours with her being questioned by these guys who were like, I you know that whole story is true. And then and then this guy Joe took us to the Bronx to for her rape test, and uh, I guess in the conversation he had been asking us what we did and stuff and when we got off he gave me his headshot and uh, I eventually kept seeing him a bit for research for a movie that I was writing that involved cops and plus I'm of a year and I'm always like okay a cop I'll talk to him about what he does but I found him you know fascinating in a number of ways and again it wasn't hard for me to make the leap of how he might be in a relationship um, mm-hmm. and put that together with my own experience. So, yeah, it was a way of showing how she shortchanged herself, even though she can, she's clearly so bright and intelligent in some ways, and then perhaps unable to stand up for herself in her own life. Um, and then by contrast, like, sort of on the other side of it, and again, trying to always say, like, oh, it starts in a stereotype that hopefully by the end of the movie gets reverted into something else. Because even Joe, I feel like you end up, and it's not to excuse him in any way, but... But my sense of him, and I talked about it with Chase too, is that he actually um, wanted to be an actor, right? So, which I think is true for a lot of cops. Um, uh, so that even he's not happy in his own life either, right? With his, I don't know, amount of power, I guess. And Lake, um, similarly so, that for somebody like Nina, in the beginning, someone like Lake is like the worst thing that could happen to her, that she gets to California and it's like a hippy-dippy, you know, spiritual whatever. But actually, she really ends up helping Nina and opening her up, you know, for the first time when she reveals that she saw her mother be hit by the father is, uh, right, you know, the first man she gets there. So, yeah, it's just a way of opening her up, I guess, helping her. Yeah, they, they felt like very specific lived-in characters, but also very intentional in terms of um, the kinds of development and reactions, they, you know, their purpose in relationship to Nina. Yeah, I mean, that's the good and bad with movies. You have to condense everything into an hour and a half. But, yeah, I remember, like, you know, I lived in New York for 17 years, and I've always felt home to me. And when I moved to L.A., I did bring with me a lot of, you know, those New Yorker assumptions of all Californians do is eat kale and, you know, I don't know, sit around and meditate or whatever. And, you know, some of that is true and some of that I eventually also, I have a lot of friends who are very similar to Lake and who I think are also very committed to looking inside and finding their own, you know, truths that way. And it's not necessarily the way I did that in my own life, um, but it's just as valid. I think if in the end it's making people happy or bettering themselves and who am I to pass judgment on how they do it. And I think eventually Nina gets there and it allows her to open up to Rafe, you know? So that was also the, the trying to invert that expectation that California was going to be superficial, but actually in the end for her, it isn't. Um, and what about for you, the difference between the two film communities moving from Oh, film community wise, it's I mean, it's interesting because so much of my film community that used to be in New York is now in LA. So weirdly, it's just sort of transplanted itself for, you know, yeah, everybody that was, I mean, like, all of Victor Vargas cast is in LA, like, we've continued that <laughs> life there, you know, 
So in a weird way, it's not that different. It's just there's always obviously the shadow and the push and pull of Hollywood and like how much any one of us are going to go towards that or not. Mm -hmm. um, but it, weirdly, it hasn't really changed that much for me. I'm sure New York is now very different because I don't know anybody else who's here anymore. Other than like Jarmusch or something, you know, somebody like that. Who, but they're kind of OGs at this point. <laughs> so your significant other is Peter Sollett. Mm -hmm. um, what's it like, uh, what's your creative synergy like in couplehood when you're not working on the same project? Oh, like, do, is that like a home test audience? Um, you mean like, I, I, oh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, we're all, we're all up in each other's projects all the time, sometimes in more detail and sometimes not. I mean, for this movie, you know, he was in New York shooting stuff the entire time I shot, so actually he wasn't around at all for the shoot. Um, so, I mean, mostly on the writing stuff. There is a short um, hand that we can have where we can, like, very quickly say, like, hey, you know, let me run this by you, yes or no, end of story. Like I said, it's also a very writer thing. Like, mm -hmm. we don't really beat around the bush that what's much. Your, yeah. What's advice that you wish you'd heard earlier in your career or that you'd give to young or aspiring storytellers? Hmm. I don't know. This is always so hard because I think part of it is that you always have to, you know, find out what works for you, and that's half of the journey, right? Like, figuring that out. But, um... I think in general something that came up a lot with um, Nina and that I uh, I think luckily because I'm you know a little older like it, so I didn't make this movie when I was 20 or something like that so I, I know who I am better so it didn't bother me but I, I think it can be really hurtful for everyone but I feel women f uh, hear this probably more is this issue of a female character's likability um, which I know came up a lot with Nina that she does a lot of things that are you know not nice or not likable um, and um, yeah how unfair that is I think to in every way specifically in terms of storytelling like I'm not here to prove to somebody that you know a female character is likable that's not what the movie's about it's about something else and uh, I, I don't think that's something that's put on you know there's so many great male characters yeah. probably almost any one of these in any of these posters or raging bull or you know yeah, any, plenty of oh, male anti-heroes that's the point yeah so to not extend that to a female character and i mean that both for male and female writers seems really unfair to me and it's something that um maybe it's not so much about the storytellers but i do think women tend to um feel like they have to consider that more you know mm -hmm. yeah so what what kinds of movies do you want to see right now um how do you want this conversation to be continued you mean in terms of my, myself or for other filmmakers? Um, from other filmmakers, but I guess maybe the kind of movies you want to make too. You know, <clears throat> I love so many different kinds of films. Like I love, um, you know, like I love Andrew Hayes stuff, for example, the, you know, the sort of so-called smaller intimate port like Weekend or something like that. And I love Heat, you know, so to, to me, um, I guess there's a sense of honesty and obviously like, writing is very important to me so I think when when the movie knows what it's saying that's almost really exciting to me even if I don't agree with it because you can be there or not but it feels like oh it's somebody who has a point of view and they're here to say something whether that's you know throw light on something that I know nothing about or retell a story that's been said a number of times like you know heat is like oh it's a heist movie we've seen that a million times but fuck it's so good you know um, and that keeps happening. So I don't know if that answers it, but I guess there's a certain honesty and truth to people's voices. That's always important to me. But I'm probably not saying anything new there. Well, that's a great answer. <laughs> and you, you think you'll continue doing uh, semi-autobiographical work? or? It's always semi-autobiographical. This one just perhaps more obviously so, but, um, you know, I've put myself in everything that I... I mean, we all do, but... Yeah, um, some, and then others that, again, also about uh, different characters. But I think honesty right now is very important to me, so I'll keep trying to be honest. It seems to be hitting a good nerve. That's great.